So Acts 15 is one of the most important chapters in the whole Bible, in the whole New Testament, because it is there that the disciples, the apostles decide that all people, both Jews and Gentiles, can be saved by Jesus, which is really great news and important for you and me and most people on the planet that Jesus is for everyone. And despite how important it is, it's also one of the chapters that is least studied or preached about or talked about when you're doing the book of Acts. Because anybody ever read the book of Acts? And then you see all the miracles and all the action and all the stuff. And you're like, this is absolutely amazing and wonderful. And if you read Acts 15, which you read about half of it uh, this morning in our scripture reading, it's a church meeting, right? There's no miracles. There's, like, there's nothing exciting happening. It's just a bunch of theologians getting together to argue and debate Bible stuff and doctrine and theology. Now, I know many of you are like, man, I wish I could be in Bible times and meet Paul and Peter and Barnabas and all these other great heroes of the faith. But if I said, you know, instead of going to watch them do miracles, we're going to go to a, a church meeting and we're just going to watch them fight. How many of you are like, yay, Bible times, right? It's, so it's one of these passages where even though it's important, we, we don't want to spend a lot of time on it because we want to get to the stuff where the action is happening, the exciting miracles are going on, and all these wonderful things. It's hard for us to pause on a chapter of the Bible that has nothing to do with any of that, but is all focused on doctrine and truth. Now, I'm a theologian and a nerd, so I would be like, I'd love to go back and see and be there for Acts 15, but I know that's not normal, <laughs> right? Most people are not, yeah, let's go back to that point in time. And besides that, when you hear the word, we're gonna talk about doctrine in church today. How many of you just feel Holy Spirit inspiration in your heart? You're like, I can't wait. Anybody? Right, most of us, will we sh most of us, when we show up to church or, or some kind of convention or retreat or you go to a spiritual Christian conference, what do you want? You want to go there and you want to be uplifted, right? You want to be encouraged. And a lot of times what we want is we want the practical side of just tell me what to do, right? How many of you are comforted when the speaker just says, and here, here's your next steps, Right? Anybody ever had to do a project in school or assignment in school and then the instructions weren't clear? Or they were intentionally vague so you had to figure it out on your own? And you're just like, I don't like this. I'm going to go talk to the teacher. I'm going to go talk to the professor. I want to figure out what are the instructions. So this is the tendency in our own hearts and minds, the tendency in our world where we want to approach God's word and we want to leave with what are my next few steps? What are the practical things I need to do to live out my life? Another way we might say it is, you know, I, I just want to be a good person. I just want to go out and do nice things. I want to be kind. I want to help people out. I just, I just want to love. I don't want to get caught up in all that doctrine nonsense. I don't want to get caught up in all that in theological debate and back and forth, right? I just want to I love Jesus, and I just want to go out and be a good person. Anybody ever thought that? It's okay. Like, it's good to be, go be a good person, okay? <laughs> right? Or we hear that mentality where it's like, I don't, I don't want to mess with that Bible stuff, that doctrine, that, all that arguing and everything. I, I just want to go out and, and live my life and do all those things. So I have the joy of convincing you this morning that Acts 15 actually matters for the practical living out of your faith, right? You can't separate God's truth and God's theology and biblical doctrine from how you live out your faith in Jesus with all the people that you encounter, you live with and work with, right? So in Acts 15, we're gonna see a few things that are incredibly important for our understanding of the gospel. 
Because as much as it's a good intention to say, I want to go and live out the gospel, I want to just go out there and, and share the love of Jesus, I don't want to get caught up in all the doctrine stuff. If you don't get the gospel right, if you don't have a good understanding of what the gospel really is, what, what are you intending to share with people, right? It's good in intention to say, I want to just go out there and love and serve and help people. That's Great, God's word tells us to do that. But if we don't know what the gospel is, if we don't have it right in our own hearts and minds, it's gonna affect how we live and it's going to affect what we end up sharing with the world around us. Right, so Acts chapter 15, the first thing that it teaches us about the gospel is this. The gospel is an announcement, okay? I know nobody really gets excited when I get to the part of the service of before the blessing and benediction, that's my line, what comes next, y'all? Got a couple announcements for you. And you guys glaze over like no one's business. You're like, just get to the blessing, pastor, all right? (laughs) Because we hear church announcements, we're like, yeah, okay, it's written down in order. All right, here's the deal. The gospel is a church announcement that you really want to pay attention to, all right? The word means literally good news. It's a proclamation of news and events that have happened that are good for us. The Greek word euangelion, that's what it literally means. It means a proclamation of good news, right? So most of the time when you and I are paying attention to the worldly news, what do we get? Bad news, negative news all kinds of things, and maybe at the very end, they'll give you one little nice story about a puppy. You're like, oh, all right, great. But the gospel itself is a news announcement. It is a proclamation of what God has done through Jesus. What we tend to make it, and the world tends to make it, is good advice. Right? Almost every religion, every worldview, every philosophy, whatever one you want to follow is going to have for you good advice. This is how you need to live. These are the next steps you need to take. Here's what you need to do. And the gospel of Jesus is not good advice. It is good news. It is an announcement telling you as a sinner, here is what has already been done for you in Jesus. So in Acts 15, verse 1, we see the early church struggling with this because all Christians, all humans struggle with the gospel. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And in verse 5, we see it again, some believers at the meeting who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. So when you see the word here, circumcised, it's not just that one act from the Old Testament where God told Abraham and then told Moses and all the people of Israel, this is what you're going to do to keep the covenant. What it is is it's shorthand for you must do all the things of the Old Testament, all the laws, all the Old Testament rules, all the book of Leviticus that you don't want to read. He's saying it includes all of that. And so in verses one and five, you have to understand what it says is it's not non-Christians coming to the church meeting and going into churches trying to cause trouble, right? It's believers. Verse one, it says, some men came down from Judea And in verse five, it says, some believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees. So what is happening here is you have a group of Christians telling another group of Christians, right? At the time, it's the Jewish Christians, some of the Jewish Christians telling the Gentile Christians, in order to really be saved, here's what you must do. Believe in Jesus, that's great, he's awesome. But in addition to that, here's what else you need to do. You need to be circumcised and do the whole law of Moses. All all those rules back here that you don't have memorized, that I don't have memorized, 
They're saying, these are the things you need to do. So what is happening? They're saying, here is the gospel, is what they're saying. You need to believe in Jesus and you need to do these other things. You need to live in this way. You need to perform in this way. Now here's the reality. Martin Luther says we need to hear the gospel every day because we forget it every day. He also at other times in his letter on Galatians says the gospel of Jesus is the most alien thing in all the universe. Meaning it's so foreign and so different to us that we have, it, we have trouble trusting it and believing it. Because we struggle with grace as human beings. Here's how I always show this example. Anybody ever taken somebody out for dinner or for lunch? A couple of you are generous. The rest of us are, we're going for the free ones, right? But what happens at that table when you have a group of friends and then the waiter comes along and says the most awkward question because you haven't talked about it yet? Separate checks or one check? And everybody kind of goes, well... Who's here today? <laughs> and then sometimes what? One person in the group will say, I've got it, right? And they're being, and then everybody does the fake thing because you are trying to pretend like you don't want a free meal, all right? Which is, oh, no, no, let me help, right? Anybody ever done this game? And they're like, no, 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 I've got it, all right? And you do the fake reach for, oh, you were too fast. Okay, you get it. And then inevitably, somebody at the table will say, what? I'll get it next time, right? We, we have this memorized as people. And what does that mean? It means we struggle with grace. We struggle with kindness. We struggle with people just simply loving us without paying them back, right? It's a default condition of our hearts of, no, I'll make it up to you, I'll pay it back, I'll get back to you. And we do the same thing with the gospel and with our relationship with God. When the gospel is announced and says, it is not good advice, it is not a task list for you, it is simply an announcement of, this is who Jesus is, this is what he did for you on the cross to forgive your sins and rose from the dead to give you gift of eternal life, and you do nothing for it. He simply gives it to you out of pure love. Now, I know when we're in church, we say, if we, as Lutherans, we'd say amen, right? Because we are saved by grace. But when we start to live it out, we struggle with it because we think there's gotta be more to it. I've got to, I've got to pay God back. I've got to make it up to him a little bit. And so there's negative sides to how I've seen this play out, which is people feel all kinds of guilt. They're like, no, I've got to make up for the sin. I've got to do better. I've got to try a little bit harder. And there's also the positive version, which is just as bad. It's just, as Luther would say, it's the other side of the falling off the horse, which is my life is like a thank you letter to God. I'm just praising him and giving thanks to him with the way I live to show him how grateful I really am for the gospel. Here's two things of the gospel that you need to know and understand. Jesus did it all already. That is the good news announcement for you. And there was nothing you could do. There's nothing you could add to it. It's already fully, completely done. That's what's being announced to you. And there's nothing more to add to it. There's not like he did some of it and I'll do the rest. No, he's taking care of all your sin, all of your guilt, all your shame, 100% freely. And this is what we mean when we say the word gospel. We're announcing to sinners, you are freely forgiven and loved by Jesus. And he has done all the work necessary for you to be saved. Now, I know when we're reading the Bible, sometimes we read verses one and five, we're like, oh, the Pharisees, oh, sir, that's not a struggle for us. But turning the gospel from good news to good advice is still a struggle for all human hearts. We want to judge people. We want to measure ourselves against others. We want to say, this is what it means to be a good Christian, right? And then... More specifically than that, we get to the point where we say, this is what it means to be a good Lutheran. 
How many of you are good Lutherans? Some of you are like, I don't know if I'm supposed to raise my hand right now. Okay, <laughs> I'm just joking. Right? But we, have anybody ever encountered this? Right? Where, oh, this is what it means to be a good Christian. This is what it means to be a good loser. Oh, this is what it means. And then when other people don't do what? Fit that category or do those things, what do we tend to think? We might not say it as meanly out loud as they did in Acts 15, but what do we tend to think in our hearts? I'm better than them. Right? Or well, they're not really a Christian yet. See, this is not just a problem for, oh, back in Acts 15, they had the argument and they solved it. This is why knowing the gospel is so important because when you go out in the world to fulfill the great commission that Jesus has given to you, and we pray and talk about all the time here at this church, you're not going out into the world to tell people, Here's some good advice on how to clean yourself up and live better and look more like me. You're going out into the world to share the good news of here's what Jesus has done for sinners. He has already forgiven and loved you perfectly. And you don't have to do any more else to clean yourself up or to make yourself better. God already loves you. Those are two different things, guys. And so, yeah, I know, we're, we're all excited. We're gonna, we're gonna serve people. We just wanna go out and love. We don't get caught up. But you will make a bigger difference in the world. We will make a bigger difference in the world when we get the gospel right. And we always remember each and every day for ourselves and for the rest of the world, it is the good news of Jesus when what he has already done, and there's no adding to it. The second thing, the gospel, the saving of people's lives and souls is the work of the Holy Spirit. So, before you rush out of here today and go and do the Great Commission and love and serve people, I want you to take a deep breath and remind yourself it doesn't depend on you. All right, so everybody just take like a little sigh of relief going, okay, I've got my part to play. God wants to work through you and in you, but salvation is a work of the Holy Spirit. So we see in verses eight and nine, Peter is standing up and he's proclaiming the gospel, he's preaching, he's talking about how God has worked through him to save Gentiles, people that they thought weren't good enough, and he says this in verses eight and nine, and God who knows the heart bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. So when Peter starts sharing, here's how we know Gentiles can be saved. Here's how we know people that are not like us, people that aren't even Lutheran, can be saved. And Peter's evidence is, well, God gave them what? The Holy Spirit, not just a little bit of the Holy Spirit, not just some of the Holy Spirit, but what? The same Holy Spirit just as had been given to Peter and the apostles. And you know what that is? Acts chapter two, in the day of Pentecost. And then Peter says something incredibly important. He says, God made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. So here's the idea, the, the whole point in the Old Testament of all of those circumcision and law of Moses and all those commands was to remind people and point people to this idea that we are unclean, we are sinners. And not just on the outside, but on the inside. Our hearts and our souls need to be made clean and washed clean from sin and guilt and shame. And so when you get to Jesus, who is the fulfillment of all that, now God is opening the floodgates and saying, it's not just a select group of people that I'm allowing to be made clean, and it's not through rituals and ceremonies and sacrifices that I'm allowing people to be made clean. It is now through faith in Jesus and what he has done on the cross that makes people clean. And so Peter is saying something incredibly important about the gospel for you and me and for the whole world to understand. He's saying God makes no distinction, which is a mind-blowing reality. 
Because all we do as human beings is what? Make distinctions. And we're really good at it. And most of the time, if we're honest, the distinctions are not there to build other people up, are they? What do we most of the time use distinctions for? To tear other people down so I can what? Feel better about myself, feel closer to God, whatever you might want to label it. And Peter is telling a group of people who are Christians, they're really good church people in Acts 15. There's, there's no unbelievers in Acts 15. It's all Christians. And you got people that grew up religious, they grew up with the Bible, they grew up going to church every Sunday, never miss a service. And Peter looks at him and says, here's the reality of the gospel. God has given the Holy Spirit and he has made clean, he has made holy, he has saved by faith all the dirty, unreligious Gentiles just as the way he has saved and made clean all of the good church religious people. Peter's saying he makes no distinction in our hearts because what saves us is not our performance. It's not how well we do. It's not how good we are doing this week. Peter's saying here's what <laughs> saves you. It is being cleansed in your heart by faith, by trusting in who Jesus is and what he has done for you in the cross. So the first reality of the gospel that we have to remember when we go out and share it, when we want to see people's lives changed by Jesus, right? If you are in agreement that we would like to see more people know Jesus, you have to get these things right. One is that the gospel is good news, not good advice. It is an announcement telling people, this is what Jesus has done for you. And the second is, God doesn't make a distinction on who can be saved and who can't be saved. The Holy Spirit, Peter says, was given both to the Jews and to the Gentiles. People who grew up hearing about God and reading the Bible and people that had gone to pagan temples their whole lives. Peter says, through faith, God saves both. So there's no distinction. Now, how does this practically get lived out? Verses 11 and 10, Peter says, Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. So when you go out into the world, we go, well, doctrine doesn't matter. Doctrine matters because if you get the gospel wrong, you will love people wrongly. You will not treat them the way Jesus wants you to treat them. Here's what I mean by this. I went to seminary. Four amazing, wonderful, horrible, all mixed together years, okay? It was a wild ride. When you leave seminary, guess what you are really, really good at? Doctrine. You know why? Because it's four years of doctrine. You leave seminary going, I know everything. Now you don't, and that's a wonderful wake up call from the Holy Spirit in real life, but you do walk out of that campus going, I've got it, okay? At least if you got good grades. If you didn't get good grades, maybe not, right? But you leave campus going, I know everything. It's all about right doctrine. So my wife and I go to D.C. We start doing our first call in a church. And we start a little house church, small group, whatever you want to call it, in our apartment. And I'm like, it is all about doctrine. Now, on the one hand, it sounds really good, right? Because how many of you are like, the Bible is the true word of God? Show of hands, right? And we got to get the truth right, right? We don't want to get it wrong. That'd be dumb. We want to get it right. And then I stumbled into the awareness 
that the way I was practicing my doctrine and just being hard-nosed, this is it, no negotiations, no, no conversation, no grace to allow people to learn and grow was wrecking people's lives. And that was a really hard reality for me and a really big wake-up call. Of it's not just I got to just get it right, and I know the truth, and that's the end of this conversation. Because if we get it wrong, if we just become all about getting it right, which is our form of, as Lutherans often, of telling people, this is what you got to do, this is how you got to behave, this is the way you got to think, else you are wrong. Right? Or else you are not a good Christian. Or else you are not a good Lutheran. And here's the issue that was facing the church back then. You had people that were just like, this is it. This is what it says. There's no room for anybody else. This is it. And Peter gets up and says, why are we adding more and more burdens to these people's lives with all these extra rules? And Peter goes, you know, we can't even do all these rules. That was Peter. He got to live with Jesus for three years. And Peter's like, I couldn't do it. None of us could. So why would we tell other people, this is what you gotta do to get it right to follow Jesus? Which is why he says the wonderful, amazing verse 11, but we believe that we will be saved through what? The grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. So again, God's not making any distinction. How are you saved? As good as Lutheran as you are, how are you saved? Grace of Jesus, which means how is every other sinner in the world saved? Grace of Jesus. Don't forget that. Don't forget it for yourself. That when you stumble and you fall and you're like, Peter, like, I can't even do all of this. I can't even get it all right. You remember, oh, but I'm also saved by grace. And when you go out to share the truth of the gospel, and you go out to share the truth of Jesus and his love for sinners, you need to remember that what you are sharing is that they are saved as gr by grace just like I am, just like you are, just like Peter was. See, we, we, we need to get the gospel right because it will affect the words we share with others. It will affect how we treat them and come alongside them when we see that, oh, they are struggling, they are sinning, they are doubting, they don't have all the answers, that we would come along and say, here's what's required for salvation. The grace of Jesus. Not getting it all right, not having it all figured out, not cleaning yourself up and then getting your act together before you come to Christ. The only thing that saves, according to the truth of God's word, according to the gospel, is the grace of Jesus Christ. And then finally, they send this letter. We're, not, we're gonna skip a few verses here. It's the argument, the debate goes on, and then they write a letter. And in verses 24 and 29, it says, since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions. Again, this is what happens when we get the gospel wrong. Instead of comforting sinners, instead of comforting people with the good news and the love and the kindness of Jesus, what we end up doing, what happened back then, is instead of comforting hearts and minds, we unsettle them, we burden them. We make people stuck in their sin and their guilt and their shame, wondering, when will I ever be good enough? When will God ever love me? That's what was happening here. You had a whole bunch of people that were interested in Jesus through the ministry of Paul and Barnabas. And then some believers came along, not troublemakers, but genuine believers came along Instead of declaring the gospel and the grace of Jesus that we're saved by faith in him and what he has done through his perfect love, they come along and say, here's actually what you need to do to be a good Christian and know for certain that you're loved by God and saved. X, Y, and Z. 
And dear friends, if that's the version of the gospel that you end up sharing or implying through our words and our actions, we won't save anybody. We won't comfort anybody. Instead, what will happen is, verse 24, we will burden and unsettle minds and leave people wondering, does God love me? So we have to get the gospel right at all times. We have to remind ourselves and we have to remind the world it is the good news that you are saved by the grace of Jesus. It is the good news of what he has already done for you in the cross and his death and his resurrection. And in verse 29, they give some advice. And now, this is also important because it affects how we treat one another as Christians. We'll start in verse 28. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. So here's what's going on, because we're just, wasn't the whole sermon just about we're saved by what? Grace. And what does verse 29 wrap up the whole letter end with? Some rules, right? So what's going on here? Acts 15 is about the reality that the gospel sets you free to truly love your neighbor. It sets you free to love your neighbor who in this context is labeled the sinner, right? The pagan Gentile who has no knowledge of God. But it also sets you free to love your neighbor who in this context was incredibly religious, following all the rules and all the regulations and going to church all the time. Because here's the reality. If you, if you go on and you keep studying the things that Paul and Peter will write later on in the New Testament, they're telling the, the Pharisee group here, through Jesus, the law has been fulfilled, so it's not binding upon us anymore in the sense of all the ritual, ceremonial, cleansing laws. We've been made clean by Jesus. So we can't go around telling all the pagans, you've now got to do all these rules before you can be saved. But at the same time, in that freedom, they're saying there are some things that if you do them as a Gentile convert, you will cause your Jewish Christian brothers and sisters to stumble and fall. It'll bother their conscience. So the gospel sets us free to, to love people the way Jesus wants us to love them. It sets us free to love the sinner with the free grace of Jesus declared to them the gospel. And it also sets us free to love, let's call it the overly religious person in our lives. Because we realize these things aren't going to save me. I'm not burdened by them. But out of love for my neighbor, I'm, I'm going to not do these things in front of them or say these things or behave in this way around them because it'll what? It'll offend them, it'll burden their conscience, it'll hinder their faith. So when we get the gospel right, it allows you and me to do the very thing that we all wanna do, which is to go out and love people, to go out and help people, to go out and serve people, to go out and help people know the love of Jesus. Because when we get the gospel right, it helps us to go out and love sinners and make no distinction amongst people just like God does by knowing they are freely forgiven and loved and saved by the grace of Jesus, just like I am. And it also sets me free to love the people in my life that have their own personal rules and conscience boundaries that I don't have because I know I'm not saved by that, but out of love for them, I'll refrain. So just to wrap it up, the two things I want you to know the most as you leave today. The gospel is good news, not good advice. It is declaring to people, this is what Jesus has done for you. The second is this. You are saved by the grace of Jesus, and so is every other sinner that you meet. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for your grace and mercy. We give thanks that we are saved by faith and trusting in what you have done for us in your death and resurrection. We thank you for the grace that you have given to us that we now are saved and perfectly loved by you. 
Lord, as we go out into the world this week, may we take that gospel, that good news of your love for all sinners to every person that we meet, that we would remind ourselves and them that they are loved by you and that they are saved by your grace. In your name we pray, amen.